This video is going to be a bit different because it's not going to be on one topic. It's going to be on how they word questions in a strange way sometimes. And many students might know the topic, but the way they word the question throws them off. So I've got three great examples of this phenomenon, and I'm going to help guide you through them. Starting with this question. What is the least integer k where k is greater than 5? such that 5k can be expressed as the square of an integer. Now, as with all of these questions, do try to answer them yourself first and see how it goes. So many students would be intimidated by the way that question sounds and the words being used. But actually, it has quite a simple translation. We need 5k to be expressed as a square of an integer. That just means 5k must equal a square number. I know it's a long and fancy way of saying it, can be expressed as the square of an integer. It just means equals a square number. And you guys know your square numbers off by heart, right? Starting with 1, 4, 9, 16. And I want you to memorize at least up to 12 squared, if not 15 squared. If you've got all of those square numbers memorized, then it's going to be a simple question of making 5k equal to one of those square numbers, but of course k has to be an integer, it has to be a whole number. So 5k can't equal 1, 5k can't equal 4, because k wouldn't be a whole number. In other words, we're looking for a multiple of 5. So now the question doesn't sound as scary. It's essentially testing, do you know your square numbers off by heart, and which ones are multiples of 5? Now, so far, some of you will put your hands up and say, but I haven't dealt with the fact that we need the least integer k. Let me just quickly explain all that means. It's just saying there will be multiple square numbers that are multiples of 5. You just have to find the smallest one. So do you know your square numbers and which ones are multiples of 5? You should realize that 25 and 100 are the first two square numbers that are multiples of 5. Unfortunately, though, 25 is not going to work because then k would have to be 5. 5 times 5 is 25. But the question said k has to be greater than 5. So we move on to the next one. The next square number that was a multiple of 5 is 100. So k must be 20. 5 times 20 is 100. And 100, of course, can be expressed as a square of an integer. In other words, 100 is a square number. So look at how far we've come. We had this really strangely worded question where we're trying to find the least integer of something but k being bigger than something and expressing as the square of something. But all it came down to, if we step back and read slowly, is that we want 5k to equal a square number. That's step one. The square number must be a multiple of 5 because otherwise k wouldn't be an integer. That's step two. Step three was knowing your square numbers off by heart. And finally, step four was realizing that we can't pick 25 because k can't equal five. It has to be greater than five. So the next multiple up of five, that's a square number, was 100. So k is 20. We're going to try and follow that same simplification translation process for the next question. Again, don't be intimidated by the wording. Just try your best. If asterisk x asterisk means the least integer greater than x what is negative 0.5 in those symbols plus 2.5 in those symbols it's this thing in the middle that throws people off the least integer greater than x how can we translate that well the greater than x bit means that the number has to be above the x because greater than means we need to be higher on the number line than our number. What about the least integer bit? Well, that just means it's the first integer greater than x. There will be many, many integers greater than x, and we need to pick the first one on the number line that's greater than x. That will be the least one on the number line greater than x. So a two-step translation process, starting with the end of the question. And often, here's a little hint. When the question is really confusing in terms of the wording, start at the end and work backwards. Anyway, here, we know we're looking for an integer that's greater than x. That's fairly simple. Has to be higher on the number line, has to be greater than x. 
and the least integer bit means it has to be the first of all of those numbers greater than x, the nearest one. Let's apply that to these two numbers. What's the first integer that's higher than negative 0.5? That would be zero. If you look at the number line as a vertical thing, with zero in the middle and then going down to negatives and up to positives, the first number, the first whole number above negative 0 0.5 is zero. So zero counts as being greater than negative 0 0.5, and it's the smallest of all of those integers that's greater than negative 0 0.5. Of course, one, two, three, four, five, etc., is also greater than negative 0 0.5, but zero is the first whole number that's greater. And for the second one, the first whole number that's greater than or above 2.5 is three. So we've calculated the answer for the first symbol as zero. The answer for the second symbol was three. And so the question was merely asking, what's zero plus three? That's three. Again, the wording is deceptively hard, whereas the topic is deceptively easy once you get your head around it. So read slowly, try to start from the back if you're still confused. Anyway, one final chance, because now we have another strangely worded question, which will freak out a lot of students. This time it's on percentages. If 78 is X percent greater than 60, and 87 is Y percent greater than 60, and Y is Z percent of X, what is 7.1% of Z? Now, my main message to students is this. Most of you will get freaked out, not because you can't do each individual bit. It's because of the mass of words and letters just overwhelms you. And your brain just looks for a shortcut and looks for some sort of crazy subtraction, addition, whatever, to try and get out of doing all the work. But tell your brain to calm down and tell it that there's just four things that they're being asked here. And if we work out each of them separately and calmly, life is good. What are the four things? Here they are. The question started, if 78 is X percent greater than 60. So let's just stop there. Don't keep reading, work out X. Of course, because they use the phrase greater than, we're gonna use the percent greater than formula, which I've covered in many other videos, to find x. Step two, they then said 87 is y percent greater than 60. Same thing, stop there and then work out what y is using the percent greater than formula. Notice how we're doing it one by one, not reading too far, or going too far ahead. Okay, once we've got x and y, the third part of the question seems a bit easier now. We then do the percent of formula to find z because the question said y is z percent of x. So we've got y and x from the first two parts of the answer, and then we do one number as a percent of the other number. By the way, if you don't know any of these formulas, then I'm gonna be showing you in a second, so don't worry. And finally, when they ask 7.1% of z, that just means do 0 0.071 multiplied by z. Many of you might know that already, how to work out a percentage of an amount using a calculator. I made it 7.1% just to see if I could fool some of you with the tricky decimal there. Anyway, let's do this step by step. The percent greater than formula, or percent increase or percent change as some people call it, is new minus old over old times 100. I've done a video on this. In fact, one of my first videos, I think covered the four essential tricks you need to know for percentages and I cover a lot of these in that video. Anyway, if you're not sure which one's the old or the original, it's always the one after the word than. So here I know that 60 is my old slash original because it comes after the word than. And actually it comes after the word than for the second formula as well, doesn't it? 87 is Y percent greater than 60. 60 came after the word than, so it's the old or the original. Either way, the formula is new minus original, so 78 minus 60, divided by original, which is 60, times 100. I've done that on the calculator, you can work it out yourself too, and I get 30. Same thing for the second part. 87 is what percent greater than 60? Put it into the formula, and we get 45. Some of you, by the way, may know the formula as difference divided by original. That's fine, same thing, same answer. 
Now we're going to apply the percent of formula. Do you know that? How do we work out one number as a percent of another? The reason I included this in strangely worded questions is because a lot of people get confused between percent of and percent greater than. So here they're asking one number, y, is what percent or z percent of x? So you do the first number divided by the second number times 100. y is what percent of x? y divided by x times 100. In this case, we know that y is 45 and x is 30. So it's 45 divided by 30 times 100. And that gives us 150. So we know z is 150. Notice I've avoided any complex algebra involving y's or z's or over 100 or anything like that, just by staying calm and translating the question into easier words. No need to use algebra if you can just work it out. And we have just worked out that z is 150. Finally, what is 7.1% of z? Well, as I've said earlier, that's 0 0.071 times 150. That gives us, if you do it on the calculator, I believe 10.65. So we know the answer is 10.65. Now, please do let me know if you find it helpful for me to go through these strangely worded questions. I know that each question seems a little bit idiosyncratic, a little bit unique, but that's what these questions are like. They try and throw you off using lots of greater thans, least, more thans, or other types of shenanigans. I didn't include this as a trick question because I thought that's a slightly different area. I call this my strangely worded questions. If you guys like this, and do let me know in the comments. I'll do more in this field. Have a great day.